Coming up next, he was a notorious figure who once ruled the mean streets of Chicago. He was feared by many until a fateful encounter changed everything. But what's truly fascinating is that this larger-than-life character was no mere legend. He was actually real. Inspired by a friend of a famous songwriter who died far too young, the story of the man all the women called Treetop Lover and all the men called Sir with Total Fear is coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you remember getting up at the crack of dawn to watch Saturday morning cartoons every single week, you're gonna love this channel of deep musical nostalgia. Make sure to subscribe below right now, click the big red button and click the bell so you know when our stuff's coming out. We also have a Patreon, check us out there. You know, I often wonder how the career of Jim Croce would have evolved if he hadn't been killed in that preventable plane crash when he was only 30 years old. Uh, there was so much left for Jim Croce to do with his life. His star was at his zenith at the time of his death when Bad Bad Leroy Brown shot the number one on the Billboard Hall 100. Just two months before the tragedy, actually. Even with his career soaring, there's evidence that Jim wanted to either quit the record business altogether or take a very long hiatus. After Jim's death, his wife Ingrid received a letter that Jim had written to her postmark just a few days before he died. It indicated that his weariness... You know, with the hectic lifestyle of a popular musician had him contemplating a career change, one that would allow him to spend more time with his family. Uh, Jim's letter ended with a tear-jerking message to Ingrid. Remember, it's the first 60 years that count, and I got 30 to go. I love you. Ah, that's always just tugged at the strings of my heart. So I have to say I love you, I love you in a song. Jim Croce may have shocked his fans and just called it quits halting tours, record releases, promo appearances, and all the other chores that go with staying relevant as a professional musician. But if he would have stayed with it, even after taking a few years off to be with Ingrid and his son, AJ, I mean, Jim Croce in just a few short years was on a trajectory of becoming one of the most beloved and influential artists of the entire rock era. There were many qualities of Jim Croce that connected him so deeply with his fans. I mean, first and foremost, his songs were so relatable. He truly had a gift of tapping into that beautiful simplicity of human experience and turned that experience into something special and really powerful. Realism was the foundation of his lyrics. Nothing fancy, nothing pretentious or preachy even. Jim Croce's songs were honest, they were perceptive, and they were introspective. There never seems to be enough time to do the things you want to do. There was a little bit of all of us in Jim Croce's songs. And that's why they resonated so personally with all of us. Sometimes the songs were about what he was going through in his own life, and sometimes he'd just write about someone that he knew that you know, made a strong impression on him. One of those characters he wrote about was a man he met in the military named Leroy Brown. Leroy Brown, he was a mountain of a man, I guess. Everybody in the regiment feared him. You did not want to get on the wrong side of Leroy Brown. Are you being a world of hurt? Now, when Jim went down to Fort Jackson in South Carolina, he met a fellow guardsman he liked immediately. This guy was full of piss and vinegar. And he was always talking a really big game. As Jim recalled, even though the soldier had signed up for military service, he wasn't one to exactly follow the rules. He didn't know the meaning of the word no, either. But Jim developed a special bond with this guy where the man would confide in Jim. They just seemed to relate to one another. The two guardsmen would hang out, often chewing the fat and singing songs together. Jim recalled that his short time and buddy made him laugh. One night, though, Leroy told him that he'd had enough of the National Guard. I don't like being here, he said to Jim. I, I'm gonna get out of this place. I'm gonna go home, you know, I don't like it. Now, if you know anything about the military, you know that once you sign up, you, you can't just up and leave. I mean, to leave the base without permission is actually a crime. So when the private did what he told Jim he was gonna do and he left the base, he went AWOL, absence without leave, right? 
Uh, Leroy made the foolish mistake of returning to the base a few weeks later at the end of the month to collect his paycheck. And of course, when he did, he was arrested by military police and he was put in handcuffs. Now, um, Jim Croce recalled that even when his friend was wearing the handcuffs and being taken down to jail, he was still talking smack, you know, saying things like, you can't hold me down, I'm the baddest man around. Jim's last image of his friend was watching him being taken to the brig in handcuffs, although he actually never saw Leroy Brown again. He hadn't even known him for that long. His larger-than-life persona made a big impression on the future star. He knew that someday he was going to write a song about Leroy Brown for sure. The time to compose a tune about Leroy arrived when Jim was working on new material for his fourth album, Life and Times. That one was released in January of 1973. With some poetic license, of course, Leroy Brown was immortalized in Jim's story, put to music about the baddest man in the whole damn town. A towering figure with a gangster reputation who did whatever he wanted to do and took whatever he wanted to take because nobody would stand in his way. Uh, it was pretty true to life from what he said about this character. Now, Leroy, more than trouble. You see, you stand about six foot four. All those downtown ladies call him treetop lover. All the men just call him sir. You know, another charming trait of Jim Croce's lyricism was the way he would weave aspects of his real life into the storyline of his songs. He did it in the badder than old King Kong, meaner than a junkyard dog chorus of bad, bad Leroy Brown. The line, meaner than a junkyard dog, that came directly from Jim's years of driving cheap cars that were on the verge of breaking down, always in need of major repairs. You know, but Jim couldn't afford to take it to a mechanic. For months, he scrounged around junkyards looking for a universal joint for a 57 Chevy panel or a transmission for a 51 Dodge. So because of this, Jim got very familiar with the layout of a typical junkyard. And one thing that all of them had in common, they had dogs inside the fence property to scare away thieves. Now to slow the dogs down just enough from savagely attacking trespassers, the animals either had an axle tied around their necks or they were tied to an old lawnmower is what he noticed. Maybe that form of animal cruelty was the owner's way to lower their liability insurance premium back in the day, I don't know. But before Jim wrote Bad Bad Leroy Brown, he composed a song titled You Don't Mess Around With Jim. Uh, that was about another tough real life character that Jim discovered while observing people playing pool in a seedy part of Southwest Philadelphia. Jim was selling radio advertising at the time one of his many odd jobs that he had before he became famous as a musician. And on one occasion, he observed a slick pool hustler named Big Jim Walker, who everyone at the hall seemed to hold with some kind of unspoken respect, right? Big Jim stuck with him, just like Leroy Brown did. So he wrote a song about how Big Jim got taken down to size by an outsider from Alabama named Willie McCoy, uh, who traveled north seeking revenge against Big Jim for ripping him off. Willie was also the name of someone that Jim knew and worked with. You don't tug on Superman's cape, you don't spit into the wind, you don't pull the mask off the old Lone Ranger, and you don't mess around with Jim. Ingrid Croce wrote in her book, I Gotta Name the Jim Croce Story, that the original lyric that Jim wrote in the chorus was, you don't tug on Superman's cape, you don't piss into the wind. Uh, I guess it was probably a pretty smart edit there to substitute spit in the hook to make it more palatable for 70s radio. Can't really imagine a reference to urinating going over very well back then. Of course, he did say the word damn. <laughs> you, don't spit in the wind. You, don't you Don't Mess Around With Jim had a violent ending with Jim and Willie getting into a knife fight. Willie was victorious in the confrontation, knocking his big foot to the floor, slashed and beaten all together. You Don't Mess Around With Jim was Jim Croce's first hit. It peaked at number eight on the Billboard Hot 100 and went to number four in Canada. It was also the precursor to Bad Bad Leroy Brown. Both songs were ultimately about taking down a bully in front of the people that he terrorized most. Even if you do got a two-piece custom-made fool,
Now, as we continue to break down this song, I do want to mention our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear. Glasses I always wear in here. You know, the coolest frame Zenny has right now are the blue light glasses with multicolored lenses. Uh, first of its kind innovation, blocks plus tints, that's what they're called. The technology blocks more blue light than ever. Filtering digital screen glare and UV light with eight different tinted lenses to choose from. Just click on our info button to get yours today. You're gonna love them. Chicago is the baddest part of town. Now the recording of Bad Bad Leroy Brown, that kicks off with a jumping piano intro performed by Jim's close friend Tommy West who along with his partner Terry Cashman co-produced three albums for Jim in the early 70s. Uh, Tommy's lively attack on the Ivories uh, it gave the track the party spirit of a packed house inside a ragtime club in Chicago town on a hot Friday night for sure. The background vocals in Bad Bad Leroy Brown, they were delivered by the cadre of Ellie Greenwich, Tasha Thomas, and Tommy West. It was actually the real life slim Willie McCovey that shouted the hit him during the climactic barroom brawl between Big Bad Leroy and the jealous husband that didn't take too kindly to Leroy hitting on his wife. <laughs> Little south side of Chicago. Now Jim Croce was nominated for two Grammy Awards for Bad Bad Leroy Brown, for pop male vocalist and for record of the year. He also won the American Music Award for favorite pop rock male artist in 1974. Unfortunately, by that time, Jim had passed away, uh, not able to enjoy the accolades bestowed upon him for the success of that single. A few months after Bad Bad Leroy Brown shot to number one, Jim Croce was killed in a plane crash. Um, of course, we probed deeper into the details of that accident uh, in a video on uh, Time in a Bottle back in the day. Everyone on board the small private charter was killed, including comedian George Stevens, Jim's road manager Dennis East, uh, Jim's manager Kenneth Cortos, the pilot Robert Elliott, and Maury Muehlheisen, who was an invaluable colleague for Jim as his guitarist on all of his most celebrated records. Isn't that the way they say it goes? The legend of Bad Bad Leroy Brown lives on throughout pop culture. The track was placed in many movie scenes. Uh, there was Easy Street in 87, Sneakers in 92, and sung by a parrot in Home Alone 3 in 97. Bad Leroy Brown, baddest cat in the whole damn town. Bad Bad Leroy Brown, it's been adopted as the theme song for two pro wrestlers, Junkyard Dog and Bad Leroy Brown, naturally. The covers of Jim Croce's tunes have had a very interesting range of artists for sure. There was the version by Sonny and Cher that included an animated short on their variety show in the 70s. <laughs> Jerry Reed, he recorded his interpretation of Bad Bad Leroy Brown on his tribute LP. Uh, it was called Jerry Reed Sings Jim Croce. You better just beware of a man to call Leroy Brown. And then, of course, the chairman of the board, Frank Sinatra, reworked the song a bit, telling the story in his classic, iconic style. And in 74, after the infamous plane crash, Queen recorded Bring Back That Leroy Brown as their tribute to Jim Croce. Jim's tale of a feared man who got taught a lesson is a tale that has become an American standard of story and song for sure. Many of us grew up hearing about and singing along the Bad Bad Leroy Brown. In 2008, film producer Warren Zide, most known for the comedy American Pie, purchased the movie rights to the song. When the rights were acquired, Ingrid Croce stated that she always wanted to do a movie around one of Jim's characters. Uh, it would be a fun way for his memory and his music to live on. Zaitis presented the project to writers to create a screenplay, but unfortunately nothing has ever transpired. At least not yet. The life and times of Jim Croce, certainly a part of the great American songbook. The way that his songs have endured over 50 years, eh, it's just astonishing, considering that his national stature was really just breaking out when he was taken from us at such a young age, only 30. But his legacy has been lovingly carried on by his soulmate, Ingrid, through literature and business and public appearances, while Jim's son, the artist A.J. Croce, has furthered the legacy of his father's music 
with great reverence, I might add, and great integrity. AJ's tour is called Croce on Croce, where he performs a full set of his father's greatest, mixed in with some of his original material. During his tour, a reporter asked AJ to name his most prized possession that he inherited from his father. AJ answered, that would have to be the guitar that his father played on all of his albums. Uh, AJ revealed that during his father's era, most artists were playing big guitars, but his father liked a guitar that was a bit more compact. In 1989, AJ lost nearly everything he owned in a house fire. One of the only things to survive the blaze was his father's old brittle guitar. Even though the guitar should have gone up in flames like tinder, it was completely unscathed, a miracle. When AJ was only two years old, his father had two leather jackets custom made in Amsterdam. So get this, during that horrendous house fire in 89, AJ's jacket was not salvageable, but his father's leather jacket was again untouched. Yes, the legacy of Jim Croce remains a captivating chapter of the rock era, and his musical influence continues to resonate even with contemporary stars. Taylor Swift, Ed Sheeran, Jason Mraz, they've acknowledged Croce as a pivotal inspiration that has shaped all of their own musical voyages. I think that's pretty cool. It's interesting, I didn't care for Jim Croce's music as a kid or even when I was a teenager. My dad always played his records, but I just didn't get it. Until I was in my 30s, it hit me like a ton of bricks. I never really listened to Jim Croce because my first impression, which actually came from Bad Bad Leroy Brown, uh, I just felt the song was a novelty song. How wrong I was. It hit me one day when I listened to Time in a Bottle, and from there on I was mesmerized by Jim's interpretation of all songs. I remember telling my dad around that time, you know what, Dad? I was never a fan of Jim Croce growing up, but I am now. He just looked at me and smiled. He said, I knew you'd eventually catch on. Nobody can deny the power of Croce. And now that my dad's been gone for almost five years, I cherish that moment and the music of Jim Croce, which reminds me of him. Ah, thank you, Jim. Thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about Jim Croce and Bad Bad Leroy Brown. What a great song. <laughs> it's, it's just such a funny song. He's got such a way with lyrics. Let us know your memories of Jim Croce and your feelings. Let's have a great tribute below. If you like our content, we invite you to subscribe. Excuse me. Um, I got a little bit of a cold. I apologize. Um, until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends.